So let's begin this process by first checking to see what we can ping. So I'm going to open a command prompt. To do that, I click on the start orb in Windows 7 and type CMD. CMD. And let's make that full screen. And I want to ping the other workstation. So I type in ping and 192.168.10.10. Let's see what message we get back. And it says reply from 10.01.1, destination host unreachable. Well, 10.0.1.1 is my default gateway for my workstation. And it's also the IP address of the router that I'm connected to, router number one. So my router one is saying, I can't reach 192.168.10.10. I don't know how to reach it. It's giving me this message, destination host unreachable. When you're reading these ping message replies, you really want to pay attention to what it's saying. Newbies to networking oftentimes look at the bottom here and they go, oh, I have 0% loss means 100% success, means that my destination is available. Except if we look at the actual message that was returned, it says reply from an address that we don't care about, and it says destination host unreachable. So although 100% of the messages sent got a reply back, the reply back was, I can't get to your device. So ignore your success rate down here, pay attention to the actual message, because that's going to give you a clue about what's happening on your network. So I am unable to reach 192.168.10.10. Let's make sure that I can ping my default gateway. So I can verify the IP address of my default gateway that's configured by entering the ipconfig command. And we look here, and my default gateway is set to 10.0.1.1. So let's try pinging that address, ping 10. 0.1.1 and I do get a reply now from 10.0.1.1. Notice how the information is different here. It says reply from that address and then it gives me some statistics about it. That's in contrast to the one where it said destination host unreachable up at the top here. So be aware of that. We can reach our default gateway. This is outstanding. This is exactly what we want. Okay, let's minimize my command prompt. So now let's go on the router and check out what's happening on router 1. So I have a rollover cable run from my PC serial port to the console port of the router. I'm going to launch PuTTY and make that connection. Let's go full screen here. Type in my password and move to privilege mode. The first thing I want to do is I want to take a look at the routing table. I want to see what my router can access. So to do that, I issue the command show IP route. When I issue show IP route, I see that I have two directly connected networks. I have one directly connected network to fast ethernet 01, and that's network 172.16.10.0 30. That slash 30 is always written up above here and how that network is submitted. And then I also have 10.0.1.0 with a slash 24 mask, and that's connected to fast ethernet 0 slash 0. If you notice now, though, I do not have a route to 192.168.10.0. So in order to add that, what I need to do is I need to move into configuration mode. So I type config T to get to configuration mode. And then I'm going to type in the command IP space route. Now if I hit question mark here, it's going to tell me all the options I have. So here what we have is I can either enter a destination prefix. Destination prefix is the same thing as saying network address. Remember, prefix means the thing that comes before. When we're talking about networking, the stuff that is in the front of the IP address is the network portion of the IP address. So we oftentimes call that the destination prefix or the network prefix because we're saying, what's the network address? Don't worry about the post portion. Put all zeros there. Just tell me what the network numbers are. We have some other options here as well, uh, including profile, static, and VRF. 
These are for different options that are well beyond the scope of CCNA. So what we want to do is we want to enter our destination network, which is 192.168.10.0. Now let's hit question mark. Then it wants to know what the destination prefix mask is. Well, the destination prefix mask, what that is, is the subnet mask. It wants to know how many bits are in the network portion. And here my mask is 255.255.255.0. Last, I want to put in my next hop address. Now remember, my next hop address is router 2's interface on the 172.16.10.0 network. That IP address is 172.16.10.1. I press enter. It accepts my route. If I exit from config mode now and I do show IP route, what I see is now I have an additional route in my routing table. That new route is 192.168.10.0 slash 24, and we're going to send it to a next hop of 172.16.10.1. Perfect. Well, let's make sure I can reach 172.16.10.1 on my router first, and I can actually use the ping command right from my router interface. Let's take a look at how that command works. So I type in ping 172.16.10.1. Let's see if I can reach that. And it looks like the what happens here now, if I get a period as a response, that means no reply. If I get an exclamation point or a bang, so we have four bangs here, four exclamation points. So if I get these four bangs, that means I get success. So period means timeout. It means I sent a message and I never got a response. Bang, exclamation point, means I got a response. And there's one other response that you can get, and that is a U, and U means unreachable, means I don't know how to reach that network. So those are the three possibilities of responses on the Cisco router when we use the ping command. Why did I lose that first message when I sent that ping out? Well, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Usually on the router, that first message is lost when we first communicate with another IP address that we haven't talked to before because we have to do the ARP process. In that ARP process on the router, we can actually time out our ping waiting for that message to come back because we have to do that extra step. Once our ARP cache is built on the router, then we don't need to do that ARP lookup anymore, and we can send our messages and we get responses. That's why we missed the first one, and we got the four additional pings. Excellent. So now we should be able to ping 192.168.10.10, right? Let's go try it. So we come back to our command prompt, and now I type ping 192.168.10.10. and it's timing out. Well, the first one we shouldn't worry about too much. Well, there's two timeouts, that's, that's not so good. Uh, what's happening with the timeouts is it means that we're sending the message out and we're not getting a reply back. So we're, we're sending the message out and nothing is coming back from anybody. Well, why is that? Well, let's go take a look at our drawing. So if we take a look at our drawing, What's happening is our message is leaving our workstation with a destination of 192.168.10.10. It's arriving on the router. The router looks up in its routing table, finds a route to network 192.168.10.10, and it sends it to a next hop of 172.16.10.1. So it actually sends it to router 2. Router 2 can then look up in its routing table. Router 2 has directly connected networks of 192.168.10.0.24, and 172.16.10.0/30. So it knows how to reach the 192.168.10.0 network, so it can then ARP the device directly and send the ping message to this other workstation. So the other workstation is most likely receiving our message. When this workstation then replies to our message and says, reply to 10.0.1.10, it sends it up to router 2. Router 2 does a route table lookup looks in its routing table for network 10.0.1.0, which it does not have, so then it throws the packet away. So the reply messages can't get back to our workstation. So what's happening is our messages are most likely reaching this other workstation. They just can't get back from the other workstation back to our workstation because router 2 doesn't have a complete routing table. So let's go add that route to the router 2's routing table 
and then see if we can send our message. So I'm going to close out my putty session. We'll minimize command prompt, close out of putty, because I want to move my serial cable then, that rollover cable, I want to move into the console port of router 2. I'm going to open up putty again and open up that serial connection. Enter in my password. This time I'm on router 2. Let's do show IP route. And sure enough, we find that I only have two directly connected networks, 192.168.10.0 and 172.16.10.0. So this time we want to add a static route to reach network 10.0.1.0. So I add the command IP route 10.0.1.0 with a mask of 255.255.255.0. This time now, my next hop IP address is going to be the IP address on the 172.16.10.0 network, but it's going to be the IP address that's of router 1, right? Because I want to send my message from router 2 to router 1, and in order for me to do that, my next hop address has to be on a network that router 2 is aware of, 172.16.10.0 network, but it cannot be an IP address directly connected to router 2 which is the 172.16.10.1 IP address. So to get to router 1 then, I need to enter the IP address 172.16.10.2, as that is the IP address of router 1's fast ethernet 0 slash 1. It is my next hop address. After I enter that address in, now I can look at the routing table again. To do that, I enter the show IP route command. So when I issue show IP route, now I have this extra static route in here for network 10.0.1.0 slash 24, and its next hop address is 172.16.10.2. Excellent. Well, let's go back now. Let's minimize putty and open up my command prompt. And now let's see if I can ping from my workstation 10.0.1.10. Let's see if I can ping now 192.168.10.10. And this time I can. I get a reply from 192.168.10.10. I get all four of them. So I have success now in sending messages from my workstation over to the other workstation and back again. And I've done that by adding two static routes to my routing table. So let's go back to the drawing. So what I've done is I've set up a mechanism now where I put a static route on router 1. I've put a static route on router 2. The static route on router 2 points to network 10.0.1.0. The static route on router 1 points to 192.168.10.0. The whole idea of the static route is adding a route to the routing table to reach a network that your router does not currently know how to reach. If we're thinking about this in the sense of a GPS in our car, what we're kind of doing is when a new road is built, if that road isn't in our GPS, and we try to set a destination address on that road, our GPS can't tell us how to get there. What we're doing is we're manually configuring the router to add that path to get to that specific road we want to reach in our GPS. And that's exactly what we've done. The important thing to remember here is that we have to pay attention to two paths as well. When we're doing data networking, we need our workstation to communicate with another workstation, and we can provide a path for that, but the other workstation also needs a reverse path to get back to us. Because without that reverse path, as we saw, our traffic does not get back to our own workstation. Let's take a look at another example. Let's take a look at the default route. Now the default route is the exact same type of route that we use on our workstation. So our workstation, as we found out in the routing packets video, my workstation itself has two routes in it, two important routes. One of those routes is to the network that I'm connected to, 10.0.1.0 slash 24, and the other route is to everything else. It is our default route. And the default route for our workstation 
points to a next hop address of our router, 10.0.1.1. In this case, what I've done is I've now connected the internet to fast ethernet 0 slash 0 of router 2. And when I've done that now, now I need to be able to reach everything out on the internet, basically every IP address out on the internet. And I need to be able to do that from router 1. Well, when I set up that static route on router 1 before, I set it up to reach a network over here of 192.168.10.0. Well, this time, 192.168.10.0, although it can't be technically on the internet, there are other IP addresses that are out there on the internet, like 8.8.8.8, .8 which is a DNS server for Google. It's a public DNS server hosted by Google. So if I wanted to reach the 8.8.8.8 IP address, I'd have to set up a separate static route for that on router 1. And then if I wanted to reach yahoo.com, that's going to be on some other IP address. So I'd have to set up a separate route on router 1 for that. And that could go on infinitely, or nearly infinitely, with a large quantity of routes to reach each one of these IP addresses individually. Well, we don't need to know that because what we know is that the path for all other networks that are not 10.0.1.0.172.16.10.0, everything else besides those two is going to get sent to router 2, and then router 2 has a connection out to the internet. So let's look at how we set up these default routes then on our router. And what we want to do is we're going to set up a default route on router 1 that points to router 2, then we're going to set up a default route on router 2 that points out to the internet. And then we're going to see if we can ping our internet connection. 